Well, good morning, good morning. Pastor Brown here with you once again. And uh, we just praise God that we have this opportunity to be with you and to share the Word of God with you. I'm looking forward to this time that the Holy Spirit is going to do something that is amazing. It's, it's something to find ourselves in this time of history. And um, some people will say, well, this is the best time to live. I don't know. With this artificial intelligence that's coming up and all the things that's taking place in our world, it's amazing that we're even existing. But it's only through God's grace that we are. We're going to continue with this study on the two fold work of the church and as I explained last week we have the work within the church of building up the saints that they may go outside the church and do the work of the church on the outside and the church has that to do we just don't try to maintain a fort but in the fort is where we are built up strengthened and then sent out to do war with our enemy, Satan. We battle him every day in our personal lives, but also in the things of this world. And we cannot look at this world and say it is a godly world. We're far from that. We are a wicked people, a sinful people, a people desperately in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been watching what's been going on around the world? Is God trying to speak to us? Is God trying to awaken us to something about ourselves? Is God trying to draw us to a point to, to consider him, to look at him, and to understand if we seek his face, he'll heal our land. But we're a long ways from that. With this sexual revolution going on, this loss of gender identity, and we have all kind of labels that we put on men and women when it's only male and female. We are in an economical crisis in reality. The way prices are going up, there's no way we're going to keep up. We're, uh, we are in trouble. And I'm not trying to be a doomsday individual. But the reality is that we're not dealing with our problems and our situations in life in a manner that will bring about a restitution or a peaceful resolution. Um, the church in itself is hurting. And the church is the only option that we have that has a remedy to all these problems that we're going to face. And the remedy is in the relationship with Jesus Christ. But we want to pray and we want to continue to look at this twofold work of the church. And I, and I think it's important that we understand that we have an opportunity to hold back many of the woes that are going to afflict us if we ourselves will look at ourselves and mend our ways and seek God's face. I believe we can hold back many of the woes that we're going to face, many of the woes, many of the crises that we're going to face. 
So let's pray and let's get into this. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your loving kindness unto us. And thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you give us. May your Holy Spirit guide us through your word. May we take heed to your word. May we recognize that, oh God, your word is a living word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It has the ability, oh God, to cut and to give life. And we pray, Father, that you might minister to us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. For those who are saved, we can claim that promise of what Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we have a sure hope in Jesus Christ. But we're praying, Lord, for a dying world. We're praying, Father, that as the church, that we might be able, oh God, to sustain, to buy some time, to bring some healing, and to see many more people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Minister to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our old professor, Lugwitson, my prophecy professor back in the days, he said there's three things that was, that was going to happen to America. One, that America would be rendered useless as far as helping the rest of the world. We're not too far from there with all of our debt and so forth that we're just about useless. Secondly, he said we're going to be in a moral fall that immorality would uh, somehow take us off the world stage because nobody would want to have anything to do with us because of our immoral lifestyle. And thirdly was the economy. We see the economy of our world, the economics of our world is in trouble. We're borrowing more money to stay afloat we're spending more money from future generations, and we're hoping that somehow we can somehow put that on this large credit card that we've given to the government, and we never have to pay for it. But the interest alone is beginning to hurt us. We have some things that we really have to really look at, especially the church. If the church is the salt and the light, we have to begin to really be that salt and that light. We have to begin to be the one who can preserve. We have to really become the ones who are able to show people in darkness a better way of life. And we have to shine this light of the gospel into their dark worlds. So I pray that as we go through this, that Somehow, somebody's life will be changed. Somebody will be touched, whether it be Christian or unbeliever, and recognize that we can do something. Can't do it all, but we can do something. <clears throat> now, we need to understand that in Ephesians 5, 25, that the church itself, as it is spoken about, has a great work to do. And we need to understand that, boy, the people of today have to fall anew in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. It's amazing. If you're really interested in Jesus Christ, and you really love Jesus Christ, you're going to be interested in what he's interested in, and you're going to love what he loves. Well, in 525, he gives us this command, and it's simply this. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Are you giving yourself up for the church? 
Are you doing all that you can do for the church? And some of us might answer in this fashion, well, I've done enough for the church. The church hasn't done anything for me. And that may be true. But you still have a responsibility to the church. This scripture doesn't end. It will not end till Christ himself come back. That you would love the church. You love your wife as Christ loved the church. He gives us that example. And he would not put such a high standard on this thing of marriage and loving your wife. If it was not a reality that was taking place in his life concerning his church. He loved his church. He gave his life for it. Do you love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love that which he died for and that which he is building himself? For he says that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot destroy the church. Some of us may say, well, the church in America is dying, and that's true. As far as the people, there's fewer people attending church than what there's ever been in history. But the church is still alive. The church is still alive. And it may not be churches, it may just be one church, but it's alive for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in Revelation, and I know some teach that the church is out of here. I think it's the wrong word to use. The saints of God are taken up, yes, in the rapture. But I believe those people are still going to be involved in church, those who come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're going to worship and they're going to fellowship at the risk of having their heads put on the butcher block. They're going to worship and hold church at the expense of giving up their life and worshiping the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But they would have known, they will have known that Jesus Christ is God. And they're going to love him and they're going to love his work. And they're going to love his church. And I believe there's just going to be such a witness that is going to be far greater than what's taking place today. But he tells us to love his church. And if you're really interested in Christ, you're going to be interested in the things of Christ. Now, let's understand this about the church. It is the church that makes in one voice, a very loud voice in a sense, <clears throat> the righteousness of God known to unrighteous people. It is the church that yells out, this is wrong. This is not right. This is the wrong behavior. This is what should not take place. But here's what should take place. Here is the righteousness of God. This is how God would have this to be worked out and to be dealt with. And I think someplace we have to get back in our world and begin to say, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. And we have to get to a place where we're going to say that because it really is a time for God to act. And oftentimes, we forget that, that yes, this is a time for God to act. And we have to come to a place to surrender ourselves to that, that this is God's time. And we want to see God perform, we want to see God do. And that's important that we're able to see God do something. And we're willing to surrender to him. We're willing to surrender to him. The psalmist says, 
O Lord, O Lord, it's time for you to act. If any time in history, it is time for God to act. That we want to see him act. In Psalms 119, look what he says in verse 59. He says, I have considered my ways. Who causes you or what causes you to look at your behavior or to look at how you function and the things that you do? And I want to suggest to you, it's the church that gives a consciousness to a nation, to a community, to a family. When the church is no longer hold an important role or position in the nation or community or in a family, then what it says means nothing. It is considered worthless. And today the church is just about come to that place that what is said by the church, by the people of God, that it's worthless. It doesn't mean much. But it's God's word and it's truth and it's valuable. And we have to keep saying it. Even if we become like a John the Baptist, a voice in the wilderness. Crying out to the people and warning them. He says, I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. The only way that people begin to live righteously and to do the right things in life is if they hear from the church, if they hear from God, and they turn. <clears throat> God's not going to make you turn. God won't force you to turn. You have to be willing to turn and turn yourself. You have to say what you're doing is wrong, is sin. But that comes from the church dealing with your consciousness, your attitude, your behavior, and saying that is now pleasing to God. And somebody might say, well, if the world don't care about God, why would they listen to you? Because righteousness is still right, whether people obey it or not. It does not change the character of righteousness. It's still right. And why is it right? Because God declared it to be right. God declared it. And he says, I have considered my ways. Now, what caused him to consider his ways? What caused him to give thought to his ways and have turned my steps to your statues? That's the thing that we have to ask. And it is the church that challenges the thoughts of man by the word of God. And yes, we have to come to that place that we're willing to surrender and obey the precepts of God. So in Psalms 119 still, in verse 168, I obey your precepts and your statutes. For all my ways are known to you. God knows all of our ways, whether they be right or unrighteous, whether they be sinful or whether they're not sinful. God knows all of our ways. He's not asleep. He's very much recognizing everything we do, every moment of the day. The problem with us is that we are a nation, a community, a family, 
that do not have a consciousness towards God. Now, we want to come to that place where, yes, we are going to learn from God. I want you to go to Proverbs <clears throat> 29. And uh, what I want to do is read two verses. 29. I want to read verse 2 and then verse 4. Catch what is being said. But you have to ask the question. Where does this righteousness come from? When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. Because things are done in a right manner, in a right way, it says the people rejoice over that. Righteousness removes fear. Righteousness removes the sadness of life and really brings about a joy. But you have to ask the question, where does the righteousness come from? And we're going to talk about that over in Romans. Then in verse 4 it says, But a just, by justice, by justice a king gives a country stability. Justice by righteousness. By doing what is right. You stabilize a family. By doing what is right, you stabilize a community. By doing what is right, you stabilize a country. And our country is in more turmoil and don't know who to trust or who to believe, who to elect as its next coming president. We are more confused today than we have been in many, many years. And yet, he tells us by justice or by righteousness, a king gives a country stability. Righteousness always stabilizes one's life. Righteousness. And he goes on, he says, but one who is greedy for bribes tears it down. One who want to do the unrighteous thing or those things that are not right. They tear down a country. It tears down a community. And here's where our families is, is so important. When the head of a family or the families does not do what is right, they tear their families apart. They tear their children apart. They don't see it immediately, but it happens. Because without righteousness, it will not be stable. And eventually, it tears apart, it crumbles, it self-destructs. And he tells us, but one who is greedy for bribes, and I know what we're saying here with bribes, but he said it tears it down. What is taking a bribes? Unrighteousness. Not doing the right thing. But is greedy for bribes, uh, greedy for doing the wrong thing. And we tear it down. We tear down that thing that we're trying to build. Now, why don't you go to also Proverbs 24, 10 through 12. Proverbs 24, verses 10 through 12. Now, I want you to hear, and I want to put this in also in the context of the church. And yes, the church is not mentioned here. But I believe it is part of the work of the church. If we look at our society and we look at our community, we look at our country, we look at the world. He says in verse 10, if you falter in times of trouble, now the question that has to be asked is this, are we in trouble today? 
Yes, we are. We're in trouble in many countries around the world. We're not in the best relationship with either Russia or China. We're holding on by threads with India and some others. But we need help in our relationship and dealing with the rest of the world. And he goes on and he says, you falter in times of trouble. Are we in economical trouble? Yes, we are. We don't know if we're going to have another 2008 or if it's going to be worse than 2008. We see the interest rates continue to climb. We've seen gas climb. We've seen food prices climb. And the other day when my wife and I, when we were in the uh, shopping uh, center, uh, one of the grocery stores, she looked at a small bag of potato chips that was a dollar twenty-five, now five dollars. The inflation is just eating everything up. And somehow people think more money is going to somehow help them or cure their woes. And more money right now is not the answer. But our economy is in trouble. And he goes on and he says, boy, if you falter in times of trouble, our families are in trouble. Many of our children don't know if they are male or female. Many of our adults are so sexually active in things that they should not be active in. And this world playboy would make what's happening today, oh, piece of cake. Playboy would be angels compared to what happening today in our society. Are we in trouble? If you falter, who is he talking to? I believe it's his people again. And I believe I can apply that to the church. If the church falters in the time of trouble, now catch the second part of this verse. How small is your strength? How small is your strength? How small is your strength? Or how small is your faith? See, my strength derives from my faith. If I have little faith, I have little strength. If I have great faith, I have great strength. The strength derives from one's faith. And that is the church. If, if the church has lost its strength to really be the voice to the consciousness of a nation, to a community, to the families, then what has happened to our faith? And we have to ask that question. And he goes on. In time of trouble, how small is your strength? How small is the strength of the church today? What kind of effect are we having on our families, on our community, on our nation, on our country? How small is our strength? If we are the voice that speaks to the conscience of all these, and we're faltering, oh, the trouble that we're in. And I want to say to you, we need to regather ourselves and we need to speak the word of God very clearly to the consciousness of a nation, to the consciousness of a community, to the consciousness of families, to individuals. And he goes on in verse 11. Look, listen to what he says in verse 11 here. He says, rescue those being led away to death. Rescue those being led away to death. 
hard work of the church. Outside the church, we're rescuing those who are being led astray by Satan, by sin, because the wages of sin is death. And the church has a responsibility of rescuing these. And we have to be willing to step out there into this world and rescue individuals. And yes, that is a tough job today because many people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ as a savior. They want money, they want food, they want housing, they want clothing, they desire the things of this world, but not Jesus Christ. So therefore it makes it harder for the church to deliver a message about Jesus Christ. But in tough times, our job is to continue to spread the word, speak the word into the hearts of people. And we repeat it again and again and again. And we become that voice crying in the wilderness. We become the salt. We become the light. We become the righteousness of God, declaring the righteousness of God. And he says, rescue those being led away. Do you see many people today being led away in your family? Do you see many people in the world being led away? Satan is leading people away from the church, away from the truth of God. They're being led away by demons and by a word that is not from God. Even the church people, those who say they are saved and they love the Lord Jesus Christ, have been led away from being involved in church and being at church that it is putting many churches in danger. Yes, we see our mega churches, but do you understand there's very few mega churches compared to how many churches there are that are between 50 to 100 and 125 people? They're not mega churches, they're small churches scattered throughout the United States. But yet many of those churches are beginning to really struggle for the lack of concern of people to be involved in the church, to be part of a church, because they're being led away. And one of the deceptive things of Satan is simply this, that you can have church at home. No, you can't. You don't even have what makes up a church at home. You cannot have church at home. Oh, you can worship at home, yes. You can praise God in your car, yes. You don't have to be in what we call a church building. But you cannot have church unless the brothers and sisters are gathered there together. And there is some type of structure in that that allows it to be called a church. It's just not a meeting place of some people who want to argue about this or argue about that. That's not church. But it's where Jesus Christ is focused upon and the people of God are being taught. And there are shepherds and elders who watch over the people. And that the church as a whole is planning and doing something that will affect the community outside of its own four walls. He says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. What can the church do? We can hold back. We can slow it down. May, we may not be able to stop it, but we certainly should be able to slow it up. Those who are being led away to slaughter by Satan. We should be able to slow it up, reduce that number of lost people.
people. And he tells us again in verse 12, if you say, but we know nothing about this, listen to what he's saying here. And I believe he's speaking to his people. He's speaking to the church. If you say you know nothing about this, if you say you don't know that the families of America are in trouble, then you're the one that's in trouble. If you say today the economy is not in trouble, then, then you're blinded. If you're saying there is no such thing as sin, people can do whatever they want to do, and that uh, just because you do something that is not right in somebody else's sight, that doesn't mean that you're wrong. If it's not good in the sight of God, in the sight of the righteous, then you're wrong. You're wrong. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, and the church is saying today in many of these areas, I know nothing about this. I don't know about this transgender stuff. I don't really know nothing about this gay stuff. I don't know anything about all these people who just shack up together. I don't know about these individuals who are having sex and they're only 10 and 13 years old. I don't know nothing about this misbehavior between all these teenagers who want to hurt somebody or shoot somebody. I don't know of all these mass kills. I don't know. We're not in that bad of shape. Then something is wrong with you. You have covered your eyes. You have closed your ears. You have covered your mouth because you do not want to speak of it. You don't want to even see it or recognize it and call it what it is. And you definitely don't want to hear, as some folks have coined, and I want to say this. Don't go around listening to a bunch of negativeness. But listen to truth. Listen to truth. Don't give a negative person all your time. But when somebody speaks the truth and you can see it, don't deny it. It's true. Too many of our young men and women are having children out of wedlock that is destroying their lives. If you can't see that, then you're the one that's blind. You're the one who's denying the ability to speak the truth out of your mouth and say to your sons, your daughters, your nephews, your nieces, the young people around you, this is not what God has ordained for you. This is something Satan has led you into to ruin your life, to bankrupt your life, to destroy your life, and to, to put a mark upon a child for the sins of the father and the mother's Boy, will pass down four generations. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Doesn't God really know why you're saying you know nothing about this? God knows why you don't get involved. God knows why you're not doing something. See, we have somehow made this big mistake in the church of you can't do anything unless the church sanctions it. No. You do it out of the teaching and the knowledge that you have of doing what is right. And you don't have to wait for a pastor or elders or somebody to put a stamp of approval on you doing what is right that will help some young people out here, that will help some young ladies out here, that will help some young men out here, that will help a family, help a community, help a nation. You don't have to wait for a stamp of approval from a pastor or from elders. You begin to work. Why? Because the word of God has grabbed hold of your heart 
and your consciousness, and you know God wants you to act. You know it. You know it. And you will sense the power of God coming upon you. If you say, but we knew nothing, then you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. You're doing the same thing that Eve did. Not that Eve didn't know that she should not eat of that fruit of the tree. But she allowed Satan to convince her there was nothing wrong in doing so. And you may have been convinced by the enemy there's nothing wrong with having sex outside of the marriage bed. You may have been convinced by the enemy it's okay for you to steal some of this and steal some of that because they got more than what they need. Yes, you may say it's okay to have bitter water come out of your mouth, the foulness of profanity to hurt someone else rather than speaking words of encouragement and words of kindness and words that will build up. You're the one that has to really take a good look at yourself because understand, God's looking at you. And the question is, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because God will lay it on your heart to do. You don't need a pastor's approval. You don't need elder's approval. You don't need church approval. When you're doing what God would have you to do, God will give you the workers around you. God will give you what you need. Because whenever God starts a program, he also funds it. He provides for it. It may not be everything that you need, but you'll be able to function because it's of God. He says, don't close your eyes. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, that's outright ignorance. We know what's going on in our families. We know what's going on in our communities. We know what's going on in our country. And we know it's not right. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're obligated to speak up. You're obligated to speak to the conscience of those who do wrong. Now, the church that leaves everything up to the specialists to solve our problems. We got a psychologist for this and psychologist for that. We got counselors for this issue and that issue. We got all kind of counselors. We're running everywhere but to the Word of God. And I'm not saying don't use a counselor. I'm not saying don't use a psychiatrist. That's not what I'm saying. But your hope is not in the counselor. Your hope is not in the psychologist. Your hope is in the living God who wants to order your steps, who will lead you to the right counselor, who will lead you to the right psychologist, psychiatrist. You want to be led by God. The church that leaves everyday problems of human life to the secular specialist is missing the mark because God has placed you who are called the righteous ones of God, the saints of God, the holy ones of God in those positions to be the light and the salt not the psychiatrist not the counselor not the social worker but the saints of God 
We do not leave the problems of human life to secular specialists who know what to do with our children and don't know a thing about the children. Who knows what is best for a marriage and don't know what God intended for a marriage. Who cannot tell a man what it is to be a man outside of scripture or to be a godly woman. That is the church that sets those standards that have been set by God to voice them to a community. And we do not want to limit God to matters of only eternity. And in some ways the church has done that. We limit God only to the things of eternity, but he don't care a thing about what's happening here on earth. Just the things of eternity. And I would totally disagree with any church that says the only thing that God is concerned about is eternity. God is concerned about every soul, every person, every child, every woman, every man here on planet earth. And the church ought to be concerned also about the families, about the community, about our country. And we ought to speak into the consciousness of the family, the community, and the country every chance we get. Because God is not the God of only eternity. He is the God of everything right now, of what's going on in America what's going on in China, in India, in Russia, in the Arab world. He wants all those people to know him and how he expects them to live. See, we miss it. But go with me to Acts chapter 20. And Paul is talking to the elders before... He gets ready to leave for Rome. <clears throat> and he says in verse 27, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Not just that part that contains the heaven, but that part that contains earth here also. That's why Paul says that we should not be unequally yoked. Why? That's an earthly thing. Marriage is taking place where at? Here on earth. Not in heaven, but here on earth. That's why Paul gives counsel. If the ungodly wants to leave, you let them leave. But they're willing to stay. You let them stay and you keep praying and keep working with them that they might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul's dealing with an earthly thing, not an eternal thing, but an earthly thing. Marriage. Relationship between two people. Paul teaches about finances and marriage. He teaches us about our faith and that our faith does not rest in the wisdom of men but in God's power. In God's power is where our faith rests. And our faith proceeds our strength comes from our faith. And our faith is in our God who grows our faith. 1 Corinthians 2 5, and we're going to put it out there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. That's so important. Our faith does not rest in the wisdom of man trying to solve the problems, but it rests 
and God's power. In other words, this way. It rests in what God can do, not what man can do, but what God can do. Thank you for the time that you've given me. I hope I can somehow encourage you to get to church this time. If you're not in a church, find one that opens this book and comes forth and brings everything from this word. This is what we need today more than anything else, the word of God in everyone's life. Yes, I can hear some say, well, we're going to disagree. That's fine, because iron sharpens iron. And our disagreement is saying this, we're still seeking. We're still wanting to know. We're still trying to discover all that God would have us to know. But we're not shooting each other. We're not slandering each other. We're not destroying each other. Yes, we're disagreeing, and in our disagreement, there's one thing that holds us together, the love for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we learn to follow after him. God's calling you. What's your answer? God's calling you to himself that you might help rescue many individuals. He's calling you to himself that you might slow down that line of those who are being slaughtered. God's calling you. How are you going to answer? Thank you for the time. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for hearing me. May God bless you as you begin to dig into his word and see how he wants you to live and what church he wants you to attend. He wants every one of those who name the name of Christ to be in church somewhere. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you said that you would build your church for your people. Help us, Lord, not to neglect so great a salvation. Help us not to neglect your church or the work of your church, but use us for your glory, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and God keep you. See you next week. Bye-bye.